ray of sunshine. Martin? Yes? Why was a chocolate chip cookie sad? I have no idea. Because his mother was a wafer too long. A wafer too long. <laughs> that makes absolutely no sense. Crushingly painful. <laughs> Hi, Ten. Hi, Ten. Six, six feet apart. Welcome to Gasina's house. Yeah, you may have noticed we have a special guest. Martin's here. Hi. Because our friend Jeffrey had what I like to call Vermont problems, mud season bees and bears all those things but the great thing about vermont is that there is a good baker kicking around every corner <laughs> too many maybe too many perhaps how amazing is that he could just swing on by at a moment's notice with all that talent so this is martin martin tell him about martin uh so my name is martin phillip um i work for king arthur flower i came to vermont in 2006 and worked as a professional baker uh for a long time with jeffrey at mm -hmm. jeffrey's um, hip, and so I guess I'm the second, what am I, the second string? I guess I'm the second <laughs> string, uh, which is fine, uh, and Jeffrey, be well. Um, and so I worked in the bakery for a long time, and now I help with content, and I also work with professional customers as well, so. And with you. And with you. And your bread needs today. <laughs> But one thing that I wanted to start off with is that we had, Jeffrey and I started a starter, and I didn't tell Jeffrey this, I already named it. Its name is Herbert. 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 Okay. But Jeffrey is taking care of that starter as he takes care of his bees. So today you brought some starter to yeah. show yeah. what it would look like. So it's a week long that it's been going now. Yeah. And that is when the starter starts to really show some life. Yep. Yeah, yep. getting yep. bubbly. You may even see some before then. You may even find that on day or two or three, you're seeing some pinprick bubbles, and by four or five, you're starting to see some additional activity. And so I feel like we're getting into that sort of belly phase now where it seems like I, I feel like there's bread in our future. Yeah, bread in our future is a very good thing. And because yeast is so hard to come by, a lot of people are making sourdough starters. Yep. My friend Gail, Gail, did you throw away that Levin? It was a month old, she said, and it was, she was scared that Still it wasn't showing life. All right. So, okay, so if somebody does have a starter that's going and they're unsure of its efficacy or life, is there anything you can do to make it happier or do you start over? Yeah, I mean, starting over uh, is always an option, fortunately, yeah. you know, this can be undone. But um, I would look at some of the basic factors um, are you leaving it in a spot that, you know, don't put it in the mud room in Vermont this time of year? You yeah. Know, you're going to slow the activity down. She's in the south, she's so. She's in the south, so it should be pretty warm. Yeah. Um, do you know what kind of water she's using? Gail, what kind of water are you using? We'll wait for the response. Maybe we'll not. see. <laughs> but we here have great well water. I can yeah. use it for all my bread. I use it for my starter. Yeah. Uh, but I know that some people who have city water that's chlorinated, that has all manner of goofy yeah. things. Yeah. Yep. can really affect the happiness and health of a starter. Yep. So that's another thing to look at. Yep, yep. I would look for water that hasn't been treated. If you're really having problems, and I, and I would say that in general, it's rare for me to see problems with starters. And I hate, I mean, I'm going to hear from a lot of people who are like, I tried it and it didn't work. That is but, so unfair of you. I know. You were making some people I, really unhappy. I mean, at my house, um, so I started somehow by some like, coincidence of events I started a starter about the same time that you guys did as well just because, show us your starter okay Where's your starter so um, I started this uh, a week ago yeah perfect and by the second day uh, people are gonna be upset but I had quite a bit of activity I had small pinprick bubbles can, well can I just say something though that I would like whenever I start a starter it yeah. is happy almost immediately yeah we being the people we are, yeah, yeah. are baking all the time. Yeah. We have all the natural things that are in the air, but also we have essentially yeast, you know, just flying around us. Yeah. So we're essentially seeding that starter so much more than most people would. It's right? true. And um, 
if you don't have some oddballs like Gesina and I hanging around, you know, with all the yeast and bacteria <laughs> that we bring to the we table, bring to the party, we bring lots of yeast and bacteria um, to the table. It's okay because all of the building blocks for a starter are actually in the flour. The flour is where it is. There's right. no requirement to take your bowl of uh, water and flour out under a full moon and gather you know, it from the air and make it something sort of How, mystical. However, if you are inclined to do that, please do and send me a picture of yeah, you exactly. under a full moon with exactly. your starter. With we'll call it the starter moon. <laughs> I think we're gonna... so, but, uh, um, and so you have started this a week ago. It's yeah. a little tiny, tiny, I like how tiny it is. Yeah. Um, and one thing that I know, so we're going to feed, do you have a name for your starter? Can I name? I, you can name it, or maybe we like submit some names. I, I had to oh. say it, but I've never named a starter before after baking, I, I don't know, a lot of years. So it's I'm time, I'm so right? disappointed. I'm so disappointed. <laughs> it's time. Okay, it's time to name a starter. Okay. Come up with a name. You're going to do a feed. And I think feed. one thing that I would like you to talk about that is I know upsetting to some people who are not familiar with starters and the nature of them there's something called discard so yeah. when you feed it you also discard some of it yeah so tell our sweet people why that yeah. is a thing why yeah. that's important yeah and how not to be so sad about it yeah so um, what you need to do is it's called a refreshment or a feed there are a lot of different ways to talk about this and what I would say is that it's important to bring some new life into what's going on and in a, and in a way just sort of clean out um, this little thing that's growing here and it's a way of almost like cleaning it to give it fresh water and food in the same way if you had a pet at home you'd have to give some maintenance you know your chickens get it every day I'm sure so in a way um, this feeding is a, is a maintenance item now especially now where flour has become harder to come by. Yeah. Um, what I've done is I've reduced the quantities that I'm holding and feeding. I've just sort of cut everything in half. Mm -hmm. And um, King Arthur has been all over this for a long time. There's a recipe on the website for how to start or how to maintain using smaller quantities so you don't feel like you're chucking a fair amount of, of sourdough every day. Also, um, just because you're getting it out of here doesn't mean that it's not any good. Uh, on the website, there are a bunch of recipes for what to do with discard. And it's not just um, crackers and pancakes, which are great options. It's also things like chocolate cake. And, yeah. and, uh, and so I'm sure we'll put up some of those links. Look for those. Um, and there's a blog that I wrote that's going to come up real soon um, based on a formula and process from a friend of mine that basically allows you to make sourdough bread without discard, which sounds impossible, but, but sounds possible. cool. But it's sounds possible like a great, cool. Okay. And then somebody has asked, so then if they've got city water, use distilled water or oh. bottled water? I think distilled water or, bottle, or bottled water, just until you get it going. I really yeah. feel like, um, look, there are bakeries in so many cities across the country, and trust me that professional bakers are not using bottled water, thank goodness. Um, they're using it right out of the tap. But maybe in the early days mm -hmm. when the culture is more fragile and needs a little bit more TLC, go for the distilled or bottled the, water bottle if you're water. having some trouble. Do, do not splurge, though, on the Fiji. Just get Please don't do that. Yeah. Yeah, don't. don't do that. Yeah. Also, if you're just uh, joining us, Martin is feeding Seven, his starter, and he's doing a discard, which we discussed. And Jeffrey will be back soon. He just has Vermont problems. I'm, mu muddy roads will sometimes get your car stuck here during mud season. And it's a real thing, being a Vermonter. We've got very strange covered bridges, covered muddy bridges, roads. Bears, all, bears, all of that. Bees. Put your... Uh... Oh, Angus. We've got a name, Angus, for this. we got a name, Angus. Angus. Martin is feeding Angus, the name of his starter. Okay. Thank you for that. Let's go with it. All right. I'm that okay was from that. Peg. Thanks, Peg. Okay. Um, I'm using a scale. Uh, can I give like my two-minute soapbox speech about why we would use a scale? Uh, yes, please. Very quickly. Okay. I'm using a scale because if if Gesina and I and Ray and half of you guys all measured a cup of flour, we would come up with different measurements and. In that sense, it adds a level of inaccuracy to what we're doing. Whereas, mm -hmm. if I said, 
can you measure 120 grams of flour or 115 or 125? Everybody's going to measure the same amount. So in that sense, the scale becomes a communication device. And mm -hmm. it's a great way that Gesina can write a recipe and then communicate it to someone else and ensure better um, success at home. So I like the scale. That's my two-second uh, soapbox speech. All right. I think you should do this on a weekly basis on a corner of some town and talking about scales. Just show people. Just show people. But they have to be at a distance. It's true. So someone said that Rachel said she started a sourdough yesterday after dinner. She used kombucha instead of water, and it's already bubbling. Yeah. It makes sense because... Um, Kombucha is a SCOBY, and this is a SCOBY too. It's a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeasts. Um, I'll be interested to see how that turns out because some of the populations are different. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that goes, but it sounds okay. like it's off to a good start. Uh, congratulations and best of luck on your baking journey. It sounds great so Rachel, far. congratulations on a bouncing baby kombucha starter. <laughs> Please give it a name that is worthy. You can use uh, a very, you know, a variety of sizes for your um, for your vessel that you're going to use for your starter. You can use a bunch of different sizes. People are going to ask, why do I have the rubber band on there? And for me, um, not only am I looking for the visual cues, these pinprick bubbles that are in there, uh, or wispy bubbles on the top surface. What I'm also looking for is the level of rise. What happened if I feed it and then I see, you know, eight or twelve hours later? that it hasn't done much, um, I know where it started. So my rubber band is my uh, expensive workaround for that. I love using just ordinary tools yeah. that you wouldn't necessarily think to apply to baking. Exactly. It's my favorite thing. I spend a lot of time in a hardware store here. <laughs> do you really? I do. I do for cakes. I use, you know, skimming. Yeah. Yeah, things like, exactly. and especially with really tall barrel cakes were a thing. Yep. And there are some like skimming, I call them spatulas, they're not, that are just giant and you yeah. just can go whoop, it's fabulous. Good tools are, are so important and yes. I think that, you know, sometimes we forget the value of hands, but I think that the more you work and do work with your hands, the more you see like what your favorite tools are yeah. and then it's like, don't touch that. Exactly. Yes, that is mine. That's mine. <laughs> well, now that we have fed Angus, we've decided yep. somebody else suggested Maurice. So I'm going to leave that up to you. Maurice. Maurice. That sounds like it would be for French bread. Okay. So All right. we'll, we'll decide. So now that we have fed our starter, um, and Gail, please keep us up to date on your starter. I think maybe something bad happened to it because you did not name it. <laughs> let's, start, let's start a new one. Don't use your tap water in the beginning. Use distilled water for the first few feeds. And then go ahead, use your tap after that. I'm so excited to see how our little babies grow. And then now, since Jeffrey couldn't make it today because of mud roads and Vermont problems, we're still going to make his oatmeal bread. And I'm so excited. So you are on so, it. OK. So we're going to do the oatmeal bread mix. And you know. It just so happens that we're doing this bread, and it's kind of amazing because um, this oatmeal bread I have like great connection to. Um, when I first came to King Arthur, I wasn't a professional baker. I had worked in bakeries, and I had studied, and I'd read a lot of books, but I didn't have the ability to work with my hands in the way that I wanted to, or maybe that I can today. And so um, Jeffrey threw me in, and I was drowning. <laughs> like in every way I was drowning. Even the intern, the story that I tell is that even the intern who was working with us at the time, he was giving me tips too. <laughs> it was so bad. So, so um, you know, baguettes, uh, it was just, I was literally like mid panic. Um, but then oatmeal bread. And so the oatmeal bread is one of those things that I could shape, I got to where I could shape it relatively quickly. And yeah, I you, could you understood the bread. I, could, I understood the bread and it made sense in my hands and I was able to gain confidence there. And so even if I would like sweat through my shirt shaping baguettes because I was so bad, yeah. when we got to oatmeal bread, I could sort of relax. And so I have this like special place in my heart for oatmeal bread. Okay. Well, and I think this is why Jeffrey chose this to be our second recipe. Just to, you know, 
No, <laughs> for you. Probably no, not. for everyone who's following along, because we first made yeah. a, a no-fold bread, and now it's the oatmeal bread. Yeah. That, but it's also delicious and hearty, yeah. but it is really lovely to work with. Yeah, yeah. So you're going to do the mix. So I'm going to do the mix, and uh, like Christina said, we're making the oatmeal bread. The formula is on the website. Um, and in the bowl, I have all-purpose all flour. I have whole wheat flour, salt, and instant yeast. And Ray's going to put up a card that gives you the measures and the ingredients. Oh, yeah. It's going to be there. That was really fast. Well, wait, where did it go? Where'd it go? It was, oh, there it is. I'll try and make this interesting. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. So you can write down and follow along. And the recipe is also at the very top of the link. So if you're just joining us, we fed our starter, who we were deciding whether to name him Angus or Maurice. And now Martin is going to do the mix for the oatmeal bread. And if you're following along, there's also off to the side an overnight soaker of oats. But you know what we did? Tell them yeah, what you so, did with the oats. Um, due to whatever, and yeah. sort of last minute, I, um, I wasn't able to soak the oats overnight, so we used warm water and we gave them a quick soak. It will be totally fine if you decide today that you want to make oatmeal bread and have it done by dinner. Just use hot water for the soak and forget about the overnight, it's okay. Yeah. It'll be fine. So I've got my soaker, got flour and everything in the bowl, the warm water, uh, it gets a little bit of oil. Oil will help to tenderize and also just make it feel a little bit more, uh, it'll stay soft a little bit longer, so yeah. that's nice. And then. And there's honey in this too, which is a humectant, which not only gives yes. it sweetness, it gives it a shelf life and a tenderness that say a sugar would not. Your word and, for the day, yeah. humectant. Humectant. Sounds like something I put on my face. That too. Okay. So I've got the milk and the honey combined. And then I'm a big fan of using my hands, especially for mixing. Um, but I also use the scraper a lot. I saw Jeffrey yeah. using the scraper. Um, it, is, it is. As we were saying, there are those tools that you come to know and love in baking. Yeah. The bowl scraper is right up there. Bowl scraper is up there, and also what's up there is a mixing bowl of this size. And I mean, I don't think we need a ton of tools. If you look at, like, what if you were a golfer? How much does that hobby cost? Yeah, exactly. You know I mean? <laughs> Baking isn't too bad, and you can eat what you make. It's like, this well, is a pretty good deal. But speaking of this hobby that so many people are taking up now that they are isolation baking, uh, Ingredients are hard to find. So yeah. Diane asks, can you use all-purpose flour to make bread because bread flour is hard to find? And in case, in this case, we're actually using an all-purpose flour, but speak, speak to Diane. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I would say um, the majority of what I use at home is all-purpose flour. If for my um, white flours, I mostly use all-purpose. Specifically I have unbleached. Specifically unbleached, all-purpose. Um, you know, there's only one kind of flour at my house if it's white. So um, I don't keep much bread flour around. So yes, you can make great bread from all-purpose flour. Absolutely. Well, I think one of the things, too, that especially when you're starting to bake, you see, and, and it's different in different countries, because I know that there are people here watching that aren't just from America, yeah. and we have all-purpose flour. We have bread flour, pastry yeah. flour, cake flour. And then on top of that, you have, you know, high protein flours that are even you know stronger yeah. and bleached and unbleached so it can get pretty confusing to know what to use yeah. and when it's very it's very confusing and so my my recommendation for people is that um so say i'm new to baking i don't know what to do um say i have access to a couple different kinds of flour mm -hmm. but i still don't know which way to go and what i always tell people is find a recipe in a company that you trust Go, go, go someplace where you can get a bread recipe and know that it's been tested not once or twice, but a yeah. hundred times. And I think that that is going to bring people to much better, uh, much better success, you know? Yeah, I agree. Well, that's the thing also with using the scale, with using a tried and true recipe. Exactly. All those things really make a difference and perfecting them and getting to know what the dough should feel like. Exactly. Because there are also times, and I know this is really unfun for starter bakers, that with bread specifically, when there's a water quotient in the recipe, yeah. it's variable. It's true. Um, so you may have noticed in the recipe notes for this one, uh, there's the option to add a little bit more water. Um, 
and I did add it. Um, in general, sandwich breads are stiffer than if we're going to make a crusty, hearth-baked artisan loaf. Those loaves have more hydration, which means that there's more water as a percentage of flour. Uh, sandwich breads um, tend to be stiffer. A yeah. milk dough is stiffer. Yeah. Um, but, but I still want it to feel somewhat supple, so I added all of the extra water that I had um, that was an option in the recipe, and this feels, this feels good. Um, and it's, you can tell that it's still just a little tacky, yeah, but it is not, tacky. but you're able to handle it without it being just smearing yeah. the bowl. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, my preference for kneading is, is not necessarily to put it out on the table because what, what's the first thing you do when you put it out on the table? You add flour. And, right. And yeah. that's tightening up the dough further. So I'd rather work in the bowl yeah. uh, and work with a scraper. So, yep. Or hands. Or hands, or hands. Washed Obviously hands. hands, yeah, clean 20 hands. 20-second washed hands. <laughs> I now, say happy birthday. Yes, that, yeah, I'm getting sick of happy birthday. Twice. <laughs> now we've got two other suggestions for the name Vladimir Gluten. Wow. Beauty and the yeast. <laughs> I, I, now I'm totally, this is a conundrum. There's so many names that I am enjoying. It's going to be tough. Do you need a uh, plastic wrap to put on top of that? I'll take that or a lid or something like that. I think I you even... see over there on your bench to the left where the speed rack is, there is a, um, a non-brand uh, plastic wrap I'll right there. I'll get that. I'm going to rinse my hands real quickly. And Rinsing then... important. So while he's rinsing, he's going to cover after, yeah. cover that little mix so that it can bulk ferment, which means it's going to get big and bubbly and yummy. And that takes, it really depends, right? You don't want it too, too warm, but you don't want it too, too cold. It will take too long. So we're thinking, what, an hour or two? Yeah, an hour. The, the recipe calls for an hour. Um, maybe I'll come away from cleaning my hands for one second. I'll just say that, like, the recipe calls for an hour. Um, is your house warm? I mean, it's warm in here, but it's is your warm house in warm? here, but no, we have a cold so, house. Uh, so uh, we have, you know, our house is like 62 right now. I go, I'm two hours usually. Okay, so yeah, two hours. You may need two hours in, you know, 62, but your friend down in Florida may need, you know, 45 minutes, 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. So it's not just a practice of set it and forget it. It's set it and then check in. It's like a relationship, right? Yeah. yeah. Some of you probably aren't so good at checking in, are you? Now you have to be. Check in on your bread. Oh, speaking of relationships, today is our anniversary. We've been married 21 years, Ray, Ray. No kidding. Yeah. How many years does it feel like, Ray? I'm not going to fall He's not going to fall for that. <laughs> So we're going to cover this. We're not going to be waiting around, right, for that puppy for an hour or two. We've got swap out so that we can shape it. But in the meantime, I want to show you muffins. And these are really famous muffins. They're from a department store. I don't know exactly what department store. My mom never took me. She also never bought me muffins because we were vegan. And we only got, you know, brown rice and miso. It's OK. I've, this is what's become of me now. But it's an interesting thing. These are muffins, but it's also, muffins are also a mixing method. So if you remember from last week, I made biscuits. And I made biscuits with the biscuit method, where I was rubbing the flour and butter together to lightly coat some of that flour with the butter so that some of that gluten was protected and off to the side to keep them tender and also to distribute all that lovely butter. And then there's the muffin method. And then there are cake methods creaming, reverse creaming, foam methods. Interestingly, if you look at this recipe on the site, this muffin is actually a cake in Spanx. And what I mean by that is that you cream together in this recipe the butter and the sugar. That's a, that's a cake making method. Yeah, so yeah. technically, to my persnickety mind, not really a muffin, cake in Spanx. And by Spanx, I mean these are the paper Spanx. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun? You can do the recipe exactly as it's written, but I've decided to do it in the muffin method manner. Muffin method manner. Say that 10 times really quickly. So what I did is I melted the stick of butter that's called for in the recipe, and I have it on a very official baking implement, a heating pad to keep it warm, because otherwise it'll solidify. So I've got my butter instead of room temperature, I have it so soft that it is becoming a liquid. So that's gonna be part of my liquid ingredients. I have two eggs that are large, room temperature. 
if you know me well, you know that I have hens. And, I saw guinea hens and, on the way in too. And people ask if I use my hen's eggs in the baking. I do not. You don't? I'll tell you why I do not. Because they, have, they will not listen to me. So if you, yesterday, go to my Instagram stories. Two of them laid eggs that were this big. What? And one of them, and she was complaining in the morning. She was going, Rah! and I'm like, oh, this must be a huge egg. She had the tiny, it looked like a <laughs> robin's egg. And I was like, I really don't blame her because this is not, she was embarrassed. She's like, don't look at my egg, it's too small. <laughs> so I use just large standard eggs okay. and, you know, and this is half a cup of milk that I warmed so that it would be room temperature because it is cool here. So I like to warm things just yeah. so that yeah. everything combines beautifully. And I, you warm it because you get a different, different level of reactivity with room temperature liquids or what's your reasoning on? well i do it because i'm going to be adding butter yeah and eggs you and that you don't want the butter to seize to okay. and gotcha. you you want it to be room temperature anyway when you're doing the creaming method because if you're d taking all that time to cream butter and sugar and then you add cold eggs and liquids all of a sudden the butter's like yeah. Yeah. in this case it's even more important because i'm going to be adding it as a liquid so if everything else were really cold in here then it would just become clumps of butter yeah yeah and that is not a great thing to have, clumps of butter, unless you're making a really flaky pie dough. Before I add the butter, I'm going to whisk the eggs up just to make sure they're combined. And over in this bowl, I have dry ingredients ready to rumble. There's flour in here. There's baking soda and salt. But please note that the sugar is just riding off to the side. Sorry, Gesine, I'm lurking behind you. I'm just checking my Lurk. rising loaves. How are they looking? They're looking good. I think the rolls are ready, but the loaves are like getting there. Ooh, we're going to see that soon. Note, sugar off to the side. I'm going to add my liquidy butter. If you want to add oil, you can actually add oil instead of the butter. I'm just a butter freak. And what kind of butter? Unsalted butter. Yep. And it's not just because I said so. It's because, you know how Martin was saying, use a scale so that you can communicate? Well. No one knows how much salt each manufacturer adds to mm, their stick o butter, right? And since we are persnickety, we like to make sure we know exactly how much salt yeah. is in our formula. So it's going to be in there. Now I've put together two eggs. I have my half cup of milk, my whole stick of butter that was yep. melted. Yep. I, I added extracts. I added vanilla and... A little lemon, because I let like me, that. Let me interrupt and ask you a question. So, should I like make a trip to the store for unsalted butter, or what if I what if I only have? If salted? you have salted butter, go ahead and use it. Yeah. I mean, but okay, this is my theory, and don't be offended. Okay. I am convinced that the people who only use salted butter, but for a few, who use only salted butter in baking, are usually drunk when they do it, <laughs> or just a little tipsy. Okay. And I have this is my theory. No, this is no. I'm not judging. This I think is not it's out there at all. I think it's wonderful. No, it, it'll be out there now. So this is what I think. I think somebody's out there partying, they're happy, yep. they're drinking, just a little tipsy, and they get a craving. That's when you get those okay. cravings, right. like at two in the morning, you're yep. like, I want chocolate chip cookies, and yep. you never make them, right? Yep. But all of a sudden, you need to make them, and you go home. The only butter you have is in the fridge in the back, and it's one of those, you know, you somebody who just takes the knife and like scrapes yep. the top of it for yep. toast. And it's always salted, and it's always funky because it's been sitting in the fridge. Yeah. This is my theory. Do with it what you will. But okay. I'm pretty sure I'm right. But if I have salted at home, should I reduce the salt quantity? Like you would reduce the or? salt quantity. Okay. And I usually start with doing it by half. Yep. Okay. And right now, you might be scared to taste the batter. I'm never scared to taste batter, so yep. I will actually taste to make sure the salt quality is fine. Usually, if you have the salt, you'll be fine. You'll be fine with half. You'll okay. be fine. Awesome. Thank you. So I have my liquids in there, and now my dries are in here, but the sugar, where does it go? Where does it go? What? It is, for a muffin, a liquid ingredient. And the reason it is considered a liquid in muffins is because sugar, and here's a big word coming up, is hygroscopic. 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 And that means, just in, in real people terms, it gets bloaty. What it does is that when it is around liquids, water specifically, it starts leaching all the water from around it. Now, when it does that, if this is sitting here for a little bit, what it will start doing is getting bloaty with water. 
so that when you add this to the flour, there is less water available to produce gluten, making a more tender cake. So you don't produce gluten until you add water and you start mixing, even if you don't mix. But if the sugar is there, bogarting, as the kids used to say, <laughs> all the water, or some of it, it's going to make for a more tender muffin. Isn't that cool? I also call sugar the, the zombie ingredient because it is hygroscopic. Yep. So if I were just to leave sugar and yolks together sitting around, the sugar starts leaching the moisture from the yolk and leaving behind really crusty bits from the yolk. Yep. It's called cooking the egg. It's not really cooking it. What it is doing is being a zombie and eating its brains. It's dehydrating it's it. It's dehydrating okay. it. OK, that's good to know. Also, weeping in pies, meringue yep. pies, it's that sugar, the zombie. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add all my liquid ingredients in there. And I've got my whisk. And I'm just going to quickly mix this up. And it's almost like making a pancake batter. Sure. Um, I don't want as many lumps as you would have in the pancake. Whoa! But make it as smooth as you can. And it's less agitation than you would use in a mixer. And to this, I'm adding two cups of blueberries and a half a cup of smashed berries. And that's going to lend even more moisture to the mix. Now the question is, can I use frozen berries? You can, but what, what I would do, and this is what's also suggested on the King Arthur site, is that you rinse them a few times because they've got all that moisture added. And what it can do is if you add them without rinsing them, it'll make your muffin batter green because the inside of the berry is usually a little green in nature. Sure. So that's just to make sure that you don't have a weird streaky and overly wet batter because oftentimes if you just add frozen berries, it's got a lot of condensation and you're adding that extra moist yeah. moisture that you don't need. That is a lot of berries. This is why this is so delightful. Wow. And then... I'm salivating and it's not even baked. I feel like just seeing that like unctuous with the berries in there. With all like the berries. Have Lovian happening here. <laughs> it's like, and the other thing is, is this is a pretty high temperature bake. Yeah. So I do these at 375, 400. Okay. And it's for two reasons. Muffins faster. Yep. That's one. The other thing is that I like for muffins, I like them to be domed. Yeah. And that will give them a dome. You can't do that with a cake. So no one wants a dome cake. Right. But if for some reason you did and you said, I will get the temperature higher, that would just cause a cake, cake collapse. Yep. Because we've got all this hot air circulating around a very small space. So it's going to bake re relatively quickly in the middle and hold its rise. A cake, if you do that, it'll set on the sides and continue rising in the middle and then just collapse because it has nothing to hold on to. Yep. But I like a dome and a muffin, and you can do it. Oh, look at that. Look at all those wow. insane berries. And you see, that's all um, all purpose flour? Or what do you that is all purpose there? flour. That yeah. is the same flour you used in the bread. Yeah, nice. You also used whole wheat in the bread, but it's nice to have two recipes entirely different yeah. using similar ingredients. I think that's really helpful. And what if I'm low on all purpose, but I have some white whole wheat or some whole wheat or something like that? Well, if you have whole wheat and not, you could use it. Just know that you will probably need a little more liquid in yeah. the mix. Could I blend it? Could I do half you, AP ab and half? Absolutely blend it. OK. Um, you can blend it. I tend to go, when I'm, when I'm unsure, I will start with a quarter of the, a quarter of the whole wheat and yeah. then the rest. And then I'll yeah. go from there, depending on yeah. how crazy I'm feeling. So and usually this makes 12, but I'm feeling like really big muffins today. So those here are looking we go. good. And if people have questions for things like that, we have a, a digital engagement team that works nonstop and answers those questions. Yes, it's uh, like the Butterball Hotline. Exactly. We Except have a for hotline baking. And um, so if you have those questions, you want to know about substitutions, uh, you may even get a response from me. Uh, I don't know if that's lucky or not, but... You're going to be attending to Vladimir Gluten. I'm gonna, You're not going to have time. Right. All my free time is gone. And the last little thing I do, and this is, this is the department store muffin trick, a teaspoon of sugar on each one. It sounds like a lot, but it creates this really crusty top. And I know a teaspoon is going to freak you out. Wow. But this is, this is how it goes. Sometimes, you know, as my Omi would say, she would say it in German, because I said so, yeah. And it'll turn out great. What Jeffrey taught me uh, was what Ramon Calvel said, and that was that the proof comes out of the oven. That's exactly right. So, 
Uh, and in this case, crusty sugar top muffins come out of the oven. Exactly. And in really, really short order, this takes like 10 to 12 minutes. So while I finish this, do you have bread to attend to? Yeah, Martin? I can go ahead and, well, I think we can do one of two things. Tell um, us, check we, that proof. I think we can talk about the proof. Let's do it. And get these in the oven. And you know what, maybe what I'll do, uh, Gesina, is uh, I'm just gonna sneak behind you. Yep. Um, would you want to load these after I, maybe yep. I'll talk about them for a second. Oh, and then we're gonna go those to are the, great. Through the magic of Gesina's house and Ray's house, uh, we have Lowe's, which is proofed and ready to go. Um, so talk about how do we know when this stuff is ready yeah. to go in? Is that Yes, helpful? please. Okay, all right. So how do you know when bread's ready to go in the oven? Well, the place that I would start is by looking at the recipe. You know, if you have yeah. a good recipe, it should give you an idea. If you use a 9 by 5 pan, uh, the, the loaf will rise to a certain level. So there should be some cues on the recipe if it's a solid recipe. Or... Um, you know, there are some other things that the bread is telling us. And so when you feel it, it doesn't immediately pop back. It's almost like we have this air filled medium. Um, and it doesn't, um, see how it's kind of holding the impression of my finger. I'm not going to do that to all of these because it's, uh, you know, I don't want to malform the roll, but that's um, just cruel. Yeah, and it will puff back out. When it hits the oven, we'll get a little bit of oven spring. You know, the other thing is if we're going to pour some water, if you have a little bit of water, we'll oh, throw that I in. shall do that. So the rolls are ready to go. Um, as a general note, um, smaller things will proof often a little bit more quickly than a larger thing. And so um, I think these have proofed for around an hour, yeah. maybe 75 minutes, somewhere in that range. And I think, I think they're. Perfect. I think we're going to, I think it's going to smell like oatmeal bread in here in a second. I think it's going to be good. And so what I did over here, I have a cast iron pan in here just to create a little steam. I already put about a cup of water in there. That's how I do it. I steam, I load and steam again. So yeah, that's how we're going to do it. You don't have to steam these breads. Um, I'm steaming them because it's the way I've made oatmeal bread a thousand times before. Mm -hmm. And it, it helps them to have a little bit better crust. But if you're at home and you're like, eh, that seems like a painful step, skip it. It's not necessary. Everyone is going to be just as happy with their oatmeal toast. Seriously. Yeah. So. And we're also doing this out of order. So we're just showing you this step right now because they are ready to go. But we are going to go into the shaping too, so do not fear. Yeah. Okay. You want to open that and I'll go yeah, in? I'm going to do this again. Okay. Go ahead. You're in. All right. Let me go the other way. I yeah, guess we can go it, this is, way. it isn't as deep as you'd like now, it to be. Who has an oven that takes a full sheet tray at home? I, I actually have one. I have a, <laughs> in, in the regular kitchen. There is one that actually takes a full sheet tray. You really? I'm so and jealous. And one thing that I forgot to mention is that there is a sympathetic spice to blueberries that you can add to blueberry muffins, to blueberry pie, and it's cardamom, just a pinch. And it won't be cardamom muffin or cardamom pie. It will just elevate the taste of those blueberries, kind of like coffee does for chocolate. So always a little, if you've got this in your cupboard, if you're making something with blueberries, just a little pinch will just elevate that lovely flavor. Back to you, Martin. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to divide a dough that we mixed uh, before everybody joined us. Uh, because it's ready to divide now. But I wanted to show you one thing about the mix that um, I'm going to show you one thing about the mix that we just did. So I think probably someone's going to say, and you can be that person, like, man, you didn't really need that at all. Man, you really didn't need that at well, all. Well, Gesina, let me tell you why I didn't need it at all. Um, I knew that I would come back and give it a quick fold at one point during yeah. bulk. You don't have to do that. But in the home environment, especially when mixing by hand, we don't develop that much gluten. But gluten develops with time as well and with a little folding. So Ray, come in here and I'm going to show you, just have a look at how this still looks shaggy, right? It doesn't look like it has much strength to me. Now, but watch what happens. Do you see the stretch right there? It's because when you hydrate flour, that is when the subcomponents which form gluten begin to come together and knit themselves. And so if I just go around the bowl once, you're going to watch this dough go from like something that's sort of shaggy and not that cohesive to a much happier place and it will um, 
it will rise a little higher. So I go around with the fold once, and then sometimes I'll go ahead and invert it. And the loaf already, like that to me, is beginning to look like a happier dough. So not an entirely uh, necessary step, but it certainly is a good step, I think, especially if we're making bread at home. OK. So can we look in this, too, Ray? Is that possible? Ray so, can do anything. He can do anything. So. Um, what I'm going to say is that this dough is ready to divide, and if it went another half hour or so, it would be okay. I think more often than not, in the home environment, mm -hmm. things are under-fermented as opposed to over-fermented, yeah. right? I, I think that's one thing that people get, they get impatient and or frightened. Yeah. And they don't allow it to have its time, yeah. either in the bulk or, or after it's shaped, and that can lead to far denser bread than yep. you want. Yep, yep. So wait, be patient. And less flavor. Yeah, take the dog for a walk. Yeah. Uh, go clean the chicken coop or something. I don't know, whatever it is. At a safe distance. <laughs> At a safe distance. Okay, so I'm going to dump this out. Can you do me one favor? I can. Will you set, those rolls are probably going to take, you know, 14, 15 minutes. Uh, maybe we'll set a timer and then the loaf. 12. Loads. Okay, there we go. Oh, so. I, I forgot to set a timer for my muffin, so. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. So uh, there was another question about high altitude baking for the muffins because they collapse at high altitude. Usually the rule of thumb, depending on exactly what the altitude is, is that you reduce some of the leavening. So that baking powder reduce some of it. And you'll often have to add a little more moisture because it's an incredibly dry environment. And what happens is that with that atmosphere, it rises too quickly and then it will collapse on itself. So a little less of that leavening will help with that. And the other question was, will buttermilk change the texture of this? It's yes and no. If it's whole buttermilk, which is kind of hard to find, it won't. You want whole milk to make it really tender. But if all you have is that buttermilk that's 2%, whatever, use it. It'll still be delicious. These are naturally dense puppies. So it'll, it'll have a wonderful, moist texture. All good. And if you have more questions about high altitude baking there's a guide on the king arthur website and um it's super helpful i have to say that you and i both did classes out in the western united states at altitude in denver and, yeah in denver and when i was going out there i was a little bit nervous but everything worked out but i, I went and i actually used our king arthur flour high altitude baking guide because why not you know the one time that you that that uh you don't do the usual recommendations is yeah. when you do puff or you do um, shoe. No kidding. Yep, you actually use less water and you want a little more protein structure. No kidding. Yep. To help push it up. To help push it up, to help stabilize it. Nice. Um, okay, so I've got two loaves at, uh, what did I do? I think I did 750, yeah, 765. Um, and That's for the loaf? Yeah, for the loaf, and then I'm just doing 70 gram rolls. Um, what if you don't have a scale at home? I mean, divide the dough into two equal pieces and then take, you know, an amount off of that. You're going to have to eyeball it some. That's why, again, back to the scale. But don't let the lack of a scale keep you from making something delicious, yeah. right? That would be sad. So we have a scale, so 70 gram rolls. Um, and. I'm just going to divide them. Uh, I have a lightly floured surface. It's just very lightly floured. You don't want to work on a surface which is heavily dusted. Uh, there are just very few examples of times when you um, would need to do that. So if you see the surface that I'm working on, there's just a light sheen of flour. It's not this quantity no of flour. Lumps. Yeah, no lumps. You just want to work on a wisp so you could just barely see uh, your hands. Should I do rolls first or rolls? Do rolls first. Rolls first, okay. Rolls first. All right, here we go. Um, there are a lot of ways to shape, and I feel like I've said a hundred times in the last two weeks because of these videos that I'm doing with my son at home, that shaping is a destination. It's a place that we want to be. How you get there can go a variety of routes. In Vermont, uh, you better choose well because you might end up in a ditch or something. Yes. Uh, but 
Um, so there are a lot of ways to get this done. Let me show you one way to do some rolls. So come in here, Ray. Um, this is the way that I shape a lot of round things, and it's the way that I've been teaching my son to shape. And so I pull up from the outside, and I push down. I pull up, and this is a very good way to shape a loaf that weighs uh, three pounds or a roll that weighs, you know, just over two ounces. And I'm basically going to get around, and then if you stopped there, it's going to be great. Now, I might go a little bit more and just get a rounder form, but that's about all you need. If you find that you're really sliding around on the bench like you can't get any grip, then just take a moist towel and give yourself a little bit of a clean workspace and you'll find that they'll, uh, they'll round up very nicely. Um, People love the word moist. Keep saying that. <laughs> more moisture, please. <laughs> okay. So if you're just joining us, Martin is shaping uh, lovely, lovely rolls from our oatmeal bread. I have, at this very moment, muffins in the oven. And we also did a feed and discard of starter, whose name we have not yet chosen. It could so be Angus, Angus, Maurice, uh, Vladimir Gluten, Beauty and the Yeast. So many names. So many names to choose from. Okay, so there are our rolls. And I'm going to go ahead and shape the loaves, too. Um, some of you who are used to making a lot of bread might um, look for a pre-shape at this step, which is a, a pre-shape pre is, is like a rest area between bulk fermentation and final shape. Mm -hmm. With a pan loaf like this, I don't feel like it's necessary. I think that you can skip straight through it. Um, it is a way to add uniformity and structure to your loaves, mm -hmm. though. So if you feel like, um, if it feels a little bit soft coming out and you're trying to make a pan loaf, I would say go for a pre-shape, but I'm not going to do it today. So I'm going to show you my shaping method for these. There's a quick question yeah, from please. Tina. Can you substitute honey in the bread? Yes, please, definitely. Or there's, oh, what could you use instead of honey? Instead of, because we're using okay. honey, what can gotcha. you use instead of? If you, uh, if you don't have honey, you could use maple syrup, you could use molasses. Um, you same could, ratios? Yeah, I would use same ratios for liquid, uh, for liquid things. Um, if you went with sugar, I would probably go with, uh, maybe half the amount, you, you know, it is going to affect the water just a little bit. Yeah. But, uh, and, and you can leave it out too. You don't, it, it gives, uh, it does two things. One, it improves the flavor. And two, it also will aid in browning. It will yeah. aid in browning. So if the loaf comes out and it's pale, um, you'll know, or you may know, if, if you make it twice a week in a bakery and it comes out pale, you'll know that someone didn't put the honey in the soaker. Yes. So. Um, Oh, that's for us. Continue. <laughs> okay. It's the isolation baking fire alarm, alarm show. Okay. So I'm going to shape this loaf. You want to come in, Ray, or make sure that you can see it. Um, like I said, a lot of ways to do this. This is the way that I like to do it. If you're looking for tips on shaping, uh, the website can be a great resource for that. Okay. So for a pan loaf, I square the sides. And for me, shaping... Um, this is like we're building a house, and if the foundation is square and what's the other word they use? Plum? Is that plum? What? Plum. Okay. If it's square, that's always plum, a good one. Uh, then you'll have a loaf that is more beautiful and more regular. Okay. So I bring the sides in. I'm nice and square. I have a square edge here and a relatively square edge here. Now what I do is I come from the top and I press down in a way, and I come from the top and I press down in a way. And I'm using my hands as paddles. It's like Mr. Robot and it's 1980 whatever, right? <laughs> using my, hands my favorite as, dance move. <laughs> using my hands as paddles. I'm not going to do that move. That's where you, um, I don't play it like a piano, you know? No magic fingers over here. Well, no, that's just weird. Yeah, that's just weird. Hands as paddles. Come down, stretch, and push away. Come down, stretch, and push away. And I should have something that, here's another 80 word. It's super tubular. It's, yes. It's tubular. Well done. So I try and make a nice tubular form. And as I'm shaping, I'm glancing over at this guy, and I'm making sure that I don't have something which is outside of that framework, OK? But I'm not going to put that in the pan yet. I'm going to set it there. And I'm going to do another one, OK? It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, take a deep breath. Remember Martin's oatmeal bread story. Remember that even if you're not very good, you can still find a place of respite uh, here. So. I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm coming in from the sides, and I'm pressing to seal. Boom. 
relatively square. Now I come down from the top. I press and push away. It seals. See how it seals? Down from the top, press and push away. Down from the top, press and push away. And there. If you feel like the bottom seam is not sealing quite, then what you can do is you can come in with the palm and the heel of your palm and you can press like that and apply pressure. And then we're good. So Claudia asks, is there a downside instead of using flour to oil your bench? Uh, do what makes the best bread. That's what I would say to people. I, I mean, like that answer. The one thing that I would say though about oil is that if you get oil into the seam, if you get oil into the seam, the seam will come undone, uh -huh. right? It will open up. So I would say that if you're looking into alternative shaping methods or things to put on the bench, um, some people wet shape, which means you use a wet surface. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I grew or we up like with, to say moist. Yeah, moist, moist, yes. Uh, I grew up with, uh, you know, Jeffrey Hamelman as a mentor and uh, really as an inspiration. Um, and this is the way I learned from Jeff, and I feel like uh, if it ain't broke, uh, don't mess around. Here, here. So I'm going to apply some oats to the outside. When these loaves and rolls bake, the oats toast, and the flavor is far, far elevated, mm -hmm. right? And that's true with a lot of crust treatments. But I just want to show you a quick trip. Quick tip. I'm not going anywhere. Um, but the rolls and the bread are. Yeah. So. What you can do is you could put the rolls on the tray and then sprinkle the oats on top. But what's a much better way, and it's sort of like the pro way to do it, is to have what I would call a seed tray. And so on the seed tray, I have my uh, topping that I want to apply to the exterior crust, and then I have a moist towel. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pat them there, and then I'm going to put them there. And if you leave them for a second, they'll adhere much uh, more fully. So I might just make sure my cloth is a little bit dry. I might hit it if it feels like it just needs a little bit more water. It's not sopping, but it is moist. For those of you who are watching, it's moist. Moist, everyone's favorite. <laughs> and then the, there's another question about surface. If they don't have wood or marble, is there another surface that Man, is? People have been making bread a lot longer than there have been wooden yeah. and marble tables, right? So um, you don't need wood or marble. Uh, what you need are good ingredients, a good recipe, and uh, a love of baked things. That will get I you will, there. I will have to say one thing, though. Yeah. Tiled counters, not so yeah, good. Yeah, I don't, I don't do that. Yeah, I've never, I'm, I've never been so fancy as to have a tiled counter. But No, that's not fancy. That just makes rolling anything. Yeah, that's got to be bad. And I never cleaning that, that grout, forget it. I worked on a cement counter uh, oh, that totally one work. time. Laminate, cement. Yeah, I have laminate at home. It looks like marble, but it's not marble. <laughs> hey, it's it smooth, really it well. works. Yeah, okay, so look, when you put the rolls on the tray, make sure that they're evenly distributed. Evenly distributing them makes for a better bake. So don't put, you know, don't put one over next to that guy because these are going to expand as they proof. Okay, so those look pretty good. I'm gonna quickly do the loaves and I'm going to do the loaves basically the same way. I'm just going to roll them through. I'm going to roll them. And look, this, this loaf, you'll hear bakers say seam side. Seam side is where we gather the loaf. So it's this line that's right here. That's going to become the bottom of the loaf, OK? That's going to become the bottom. So we're only applying seeds to the top or uh, flakes to the top. You and did you, how did you uh, prepare your pans again? They're just sprayed. I just, just sprayed, sprayed them. Actually, no, I did buttered you? them, actually. I'm you sorry. buttered them? I buttered them, yeah. But you can do either. Yeah, you can do either. The amount of seed coverage that you get when you use the seed tray is much more even, and yeah. uh, it's just better. So do that. So I'm going to put it in. And then when I go in, don't freak out if it's not exactly even. It's OK. What you can do is just take the back of your knuckles and just press it a little bit. You're not going to harm the loaf, and that will help sort of ensure that it evenly films the bake, uh, fills the baking form. Okay, one more. And then, then I think I'm done, at least with this oat bread. That's exciting. It's kind of exciting. And you can check what's in the oven. Yeah, let's check. So there is one more question. Well, I'm sure there are more than that. But someone was asking, Becky, the only kneading were the turns in the bowl. And Becky might not have been here earlier when... Yeah. 
we first did the mix, and this is the oatmeal bread mix. You yeah. did work the dough initially, and then you did fold later. Yeah, but yeah. So you mix to combine, um, and all the process steps are on the formula. So if you have any questions, just check in there. It's yeah. a solid formula. We know that. Um, so I mixed to combine, and then I basically just kneaded it in the bowl until it was homogenous. If you had a stand mixer at home, you can actually just let it go ahead and develop. Mm -hmm. um, if you are cooped up and you've got some extra energy and you want to work it out, you can put it on the bench and knead some. I think some people have always heard that bread must go to window pane. So, yeah. th and that's something that I think a lot of people would try to work it to window yeah. pane. Yeah. No, you don't. You don't need to go to window pane. A dough like this is <laughs> gonna. It's you're gonna have a hard time getting a window pane with this because we got a bunch of junk in there. Yeah. We've got whole wheat. We have oat flakes. By junk, okay. means good things. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Delicious junk. Yeah. All um, good. Yeah. You don't have to fret about that. All you have to do is. Um, Mix to combine, and then, wow, and then uh, if you have a mixer, uh, yeah, and I gave a fold too, wow, dang, I forgot that we were working for a second, and I, I almost <laughs> came over and took one. You got muffin. <laughs> These muffins, I froze after I baked them. Somebody asked, can you freeze them? I freeze after the bake, and then you can refresh them in a 350 oven for a minute or two, or you just can just let them come to room temperature which I've done for Ray's snacks in the morning sometimes, but this is what it looks like when they first come out. You can see that crispity sugar, and you can see that dome, and then someone asked, you might not have heard me talk about it before, you like your cupcakes domed? What I did is I set this temperature slightly higher. These bake at a slightly higher temperature, 375, and what that does is that creates that dome in the cupcake because that heat will circulate around the little cups you see the little cuppies that are natural to the cupcake? So you get a lot of heat really fast, and it immediately creates this lovely vortex of heat that makes that cupcake, or in this case, muffin, rise and mound and set that way. Casino, those smell insane. They are. Do you they... get a snack like that every morning, Ray? I heard you say something like, Ray gets a s He does. <laughs> it's also our anniversary, so this he's going to uh, get extra snacks today. This is a good deal. So do you want to, did you check the bread? No, what do you think? Did you look Come on, at it? Check in. Okay. It's getting a little dark because it was a high oven, but. No, it looks good. Looks good. Asbestos hands? Yeah. Here, I mean, here. Just don't, just don't hold it. I think we're pretty close. How many minutes are we? Well, we are now at about 25, 25. minutes. Okay. I think we've kind of probably got five more. So, what oh, I would no. say is, you know, um, you have a relationship with your oven. It's, I do. Sometimes it's fraught. Sometimes but it's I do. fraught, right? So, I have, I have a relationship with my oven, and it's not. I'm not crazy about it at home, um, but what I would say is this, is that everybody has their own oven and you have to develop a relationship with your own oven. So if the recipe says bake it for 30 minutes at whatever, um, check in a little early. It may need a couple more minutes. And yeah. so develop those sensory cues. Um, look for color. Look for the smell in the room. Look for mm -hmm. firmness of crust. You know, these are the ways that you yeah. develop that relationship. Well, and this is what I always tell people that, um, as you said, relationships, this is the relationships that you're in where everyone is a liar. The uh, ovens are all liars. Yep. Thermometers and ovens. Bakers are never wrong. Bakers are never wrong. <laughs> and so often when you see a recipe, whomever developed that recipe was working from a very specific oven that was lying to them in very particular ways, yep. which is not going to be your oven and you know it. So having a thermometer in your oven is often very helpful. Um, and just knowing that, and knowing your own oven, and knowing whether it runs hot, where your hot spots are. So that timing in recipes is variable. The measures aren't, but the timing usually is. And also, also the heat. If you know that sometimes you're running hot, lower the temperature a little bit, raise it 25 if it's low. All good things, but I know I'm very sorry. I'm it, very sorry that your oven's a liar. It's, it's hard, and you've written so many recipes, and, you know, and I'm kind of in the same boat where I've written a lot of recipes which are out there, and people try them, and um, you know, we do our best to make sure that they're accurate, and we test them in a variety yep. of environments, um, but ultimately, uh, it's part of the fun of baking is developing that relationship, right? Yeah, yeah. That, the, and when you're isolated in a home, you know, you have a little time to experiment, and with bread baking, what's so lovely is that the whole process takes a little while longer. 
So you can really spend some time to see what's happening, see what these things feel like, what the fermentation looks like, what it smells yeah. like. It's really yeah. exciting. These are a little dark, but hey. No, no, oh, no. Oh, they're no, soft. No. no, this is perfect. They're lovely. So look, I, I think that you're, there may be people who say this is dark, but what I always say is. Flavor. Flavor, man. Um, I, I'll say, you know, raise your hand if you like boiled vegetables or roasted vegetables. I mean, yeah. what, what do you like? I like roasted vegetables because this color, this caramelization, this dextrification, um, this is a lot of flavor. And if we baked them to a pale color, it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be as good. So, in, in a baking that's called blonding, the only time that it's really bad to be blonde is in baking. Is in baking, yeah. Is in baking. Like blonde, blonde and that things. is a lot of flavor. And if you, if you were to look at, I think the thing, the one thing that I always tell people to look at is um, Napoleons that come from, Milfoy that comes from France versus uh -huh. in the States, where it almost looks as if it was a cocoa puff, yeah. and it's not. And it's because they have baked that puppy to the point that it is caramelized, yeah. that flavor has come out, so it looks incredibly dark, not blonded. So it's crispy, it's flavorful. Oh, look at that, look that's at that. lovely. So that's what we want. We want this structure which is evenly open. Uh, it has a super thin crust. You can see some flecks of wheat. And I already, I already bit into one. Did you try one, Gesina? I haven't. I'm going to, and I'm gonna do this too. Nice, oh sweet, that's so sweet of you. Can you depan those loaves or do you want me to depan them? I'm happy to you do it. You we'll, depan, let's trade spaces. And. All right, you go there. Okay, the other one's in, right? Okay. The other one's in, yeah. That one was, I, I think that one was. Let's see here. You know, what I, you know what I do sometimes because I, just to ease of getting the loaf out, What's that? I will line it with parchment and have little handles. That's a good idea. But I mean, that came out beautifully. But if, yeah. if you're doing something that is, has something inside that can get very sticky. It smells incredible. Can you smell that, looks that, Ray? gorgeous. Oh my gosh. Um, I if really it, like this type yeah, of those pan. Are great pans. I love the square sidewalls of this pan. Um, I love the square sidewalls. If you don't have that, just bake your bread. Yeah. It's okay. But I like these square sidewalls because of what it looks like. And I really like that when you're slicing it, you get these super even slices all the way down. It doesn't have that fluting. Um, we have good color on the side, some nice color on the top. You can see the seam, which I put down. Looks great. Okay. Should I grab the other one, I guess? Grab the other one. Let's see here. We got them out of the oven even. I'm so happy. Yeah, we weren't sure if that was going to work out. And you can see that these are different loaf pans. One is ceramic, and the ceramic one is wider and shallower. So the shape of the loaf will be a little different. Um, I personally like the narrower, taller pans yep. because that is like the quintessential loaf right there. Yep, yep. That shape is just makes me childhood happy exactly and what I should say I you know sometimes I forget um, take it out of the pan after you bake it this is one of those loaves where you want to get it out of the pan because if you don't get it out of the pan what will happen is that it's still baking like a chicken right. uh, like a chicken that you just took out of the oven it's still baking and what you want to make sure of is that as the moisture in it equilibrates um, it doesn't soften the sidewalls of the crust so if you leave it in the pan it will sweat and you won't have yeah. this crust that we worked so hard for. So take sweaty it out of the bread. pan, let it cool. Yeah, avoid the sweaty bread, exactly. And that is different from cakes. Cakes, on the other hand, when they come out of the oven, because they are so tender, you want to keep them in the pan for about 10 minutes. If you turn them out too quickly, then they will often crumble because they really haven't set. Exactly. And then if you leave them in too long, sometimes they're hard to get out. So yeah. that's 10 minute resting, five, 10 minutes resting for cake. But for breads like this, take them out post haste so they don't get sweaty. <laughs> now everybody's gonna be like, I don't want sweaty bread. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey, high five. Hey, you're Great awesome. Great job. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Ray. Happy anniversary, Ray. Happy Thank anniversary, you. Ray. Big kisses from here. <laughs> Thank you so much for baking with us. We'll be back next week, Friday. Jeffrey will get unstuck from whatever muddy road he's on. And we'll see you then. Happy baking. Stay safe. Bye, y'all. Bye. Okay. Should we switch sides again? And I'm going to eat that muffin like a long <laughs> <laughs>
These are gorgeous. They're tasty. Wow. You made that look so easy. That's a blueberry bomb. Yeah, right? 